Welcome back. In this one, we are going to discuss endometrial and ovarian cancer. First, let's discuss the different types of tumors that make up endometrial cancer. The majority of cases of endometrial cancer result from type 1 tumors. These are considered to be grade 1 or 2 and are estrogen-induced. So as we get into risk factors for developing endometrial cancers on the next slide, you'll see that many risk factors involve excess exposure to estrogen. Now, oftentimes, these tumors are preceded by hyperplasia of the endometrium, either atypical or complex, and this hyperplasia progresses to endometrial cancer. Now, type 1 tumors typically have a more favorable diagnosis. Then the less common and less favorable type of endometrial cancer are type 2 tumors. Now, these are grade 3, or they may have a non-endometrioid histology, so they can be serous, clear cell, mucinous, among other histologic types. Now, these tumors are unrelated to estrogen stimulation. Now, many risk factors are going to be related to estrogen exposure, and these are risk factors for type 1 tumors, so for their development. So exogenous sources of estrogen that can contribute to the development of type 1 endometrial cancer would include, include things like unopposed estrogen therapy. So this could be therapy used to treat symptoms of menopause, or it could be the result of estrogen-based birth control that's used without concurrent progestin use. Tamoxifen is another exogenous drug that can contribute to the development of endometrial cancer because it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Now, depending on the target organ, it may act as an estrogen agonist or as an antagonist. And in the case of the endometrium, it's going to act as an estrogen antagonist in premenstrual patients because these patients have a high level of endogenous estrogen that's being produced. But once patients are postmenopausal, tamoxifen is an estrogen agonist, and the risk of endometrial cancer increases with higher doses and longer durations of use. Now, aside from these exogenous sources of estrogen, endogenous exposure can be increased in cases of late menopause, nulliparity, and obesity. PCOS is also associated with endogenous production of unopposed estrogen, so it is also a risk factor. Now, genetic conditions can also play a role here, and two conditions closely associated with endometrial cancer are Lynch syndrome and Cowden syndrome. Now, these syndromes result from genetic mutations in genes like DNA mismatch repair genes. This results in a higher likelihood of developing cancer. Patients with increased age have also had more time for the progression of hyperplasia to cancer to occur. Now, as for our protective factors, Birth control with a progestin component results in decreased rates of endometrial cancer, and large epidemiological studies have shown that estrogen progestin oral contraceptives cause a dramatic reduction in the risk of developing endometrial cancer. Now, in terms of signs and symptoms, the big symptom to keep in mind is abnormal uterine bleeding. This occurs in up to 90% of cases. Now, a patient that has uterine bleeding after they've undergone menopause should definitely be worked up for the possibility of endometrial cancer. Now, for patients who are still menstruating, the abnormal uterine bleeding can take, can take the form of intermenstrual bleeding, could be just excessively heavy bleeding, or prolonged bleeding beyond what would typically be considered normal during their menses for them. If you've already reviewed the cervical cancer lecture, you'll note that sometimes patients with endometrial cancer will be identified using cervical cytology during cervical cancer screening, including atypical glandular cells, among other histologies. Patients will not usually have an abnormally large or painful uterus on exam, and lab abnormalities are not usually present unless the bleeding is so severe that it causes anemia. The diagnosis is made with tissue samples from either endometrial biopsy or curatage, or if the patient was having a hysterectomy and is found to have histology consistent with the disease. As for your treatment here, endometrial cancer is going to be broken up into low risk and high risk. Low risk cancers are grades 1 or 2. They're located in the endometrium, or if they are invading the myometrium, they're invading less than half. So this cancer doesn't extend to the outer edge of the myometrium. It's well contained. And finally, it is not a high-risk histology, meaning it is not going to be clear cell or serous. For patients fitting the criteria for low-risk endometrial cancer, the treatment will be total hysterectomy, bilateral salpingia ophorectomy, uh, as well as evaluation of lymph nodes and, ex and for extra uterine disease. For patients with high-risk endometrial cancer, meaning grade 3 endometrial cancer, clear cell or serous adenocarcinoma histology, these patients should have a total hysterectomy and BSO with adjunct chemo, typically with a regimen that includes carboplatin plus paclitaxel and or have a radiation therapy depending on individual patient factors.
Finally, we have metastatic endometrial cancer. This is endometrial cancer that's traveled to distant organs. And in this case, the goal of treatment is palliative, not curative. Palliative chemo is used and will usually be carboplatin and paclitaxel. And if the patient is HER2 positive, they could also be treated with trazuzumab. If genetic testing identifies mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite instability, these patients could also be treated with pembrolizumab. All right, moving on now to ovarian cancer. Epithelial cancers of the ovaries, of fallopian tubes, and peritoneal carcinomas are all managed together due to their clinical similarity. Now, the epithelial cells are much more likely to undergo malignant transformation than the germ cells. And so the focus on ovarian cancer in this lecture is going to be on the epithelial cancers of the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and peritoneal carcinomas. So we do go over these rare germ cell tumors in lung and mediastinal tumor lectures in the pulmonary section. But again, these germ cell tumors are much less prevalent than epithelial cell malignancies. So when we're referring to ovarian cancers, we're referring to epithelial cancers. Now, risk factors for the development of ovarian cancer includes early menarche, late menopause, nulliparity, old age, BRCA1 and or BRCA2 mutations, the genetic defects associated with Lynch syndrome, as well as having a first degree relative who has ovarian cancer. Protective factors include having a BSO, hysterectomy, tubal ligation, the use of OCPs, as well as having children and breastfeeding. Now, the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer can, can vary quite drastically. Some patients will be completely asymptomatic, and the cancer will simply be found incidentally on imaging or during surgery or during a pelvic exam. Um, others may present with some nonspecific symptoms. A subacute presentation is characterized by any of the following. Bloating or abdominal distension, nausea, early satiety, urinary frequency or urgency, abdominal or pelvic pain, or vaginal bleeding. Now, when these symptoms are present and the patient has ovarian cancer, it is hard to say how advanced the disease has become. Whereas when ascites, venous thromboembolism, bowel obstruction, or pleural effusions are present, it is likely a sign of advanced disease. Now, in terms of imaging, pelvic ultrasound is going to be our first line, and it will demonstrate adnexal mass. Characteristics that point to the mass more likely being malignant rather than benign include having solid components. The presence of ascites is also more closely associated with a malignant adnexal mass. Now, if the pelvic ultrasound shows findings consistent with ovarian cancer, a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is performed because we want to look for the presence of metastases. Now, findings on these CT scans may show us pleural effusions, metastases to the lungs or the liver, may show mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and ascites, among other abnormalities. Now, there are many biomarkers that are being investigated for both the initial evaluation as well as for monitoring of ovarian cancer, and the biomarker that is best studied and most frequently used is cancer antigen 125, CA125. Positive CA125 is associated with ovarian cancer, though it is only approved for use in monitoring the disease progression and the disease recurrence. Ovarian cancer, cancer of the fallopian tube or of the peritoneum, is diagnosed with histology from tissue that is obtained with bilateral salpingia oophorectomy or biopsy of the peritoneum. Now, these cancers are staged depending on what organ and tissues are involved. Stage 1 cancer is cancer that's confined to the ovaries or fallopian tubes. Thus, primary peritoneal cancer is always at least stage 2. Only cancer involving just the ovaries or fallopian tubes can be stage 1. Now, stage 2 cancer, like I mentioned, is either primary peritoneal or cancer involving the ovaries or fallopian tubes with extension below the pelvic brim. Stage 3 is primary peritoneal cancer or cancer involving the ovaries and or fallopian tubes with confirmed peritoneal metastasis outside the pelvis and or metastasis to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. And finally, stage 4 is primary peritoneal cancer or cancer that involves the ovaries and fallopian tubes with confirmed spread to distant sites outside of the peritoneal cavity. The sites most typically involved are going to be the lungs and or the liver. For patients with cancer that's combined to the ovaries, i.e. it's low grade, it's early stage, we'll do a hysterectomy, BSO with omentectomy, as well as pelvic and paraaortic lymphadenectomy, meaning the patient will have surgery with staging confirmed to be stage one. Now for those with higher grade and stage, chemotherapy and surgery are going to be warranted as treatment. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. 
Correct answer here is D. Next question. 20 seconds on the clock, then come on back. Correct answer here is D. And your final question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is A. That is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.